Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor, and here with me is my co-host Eric. Hello. Today we will be exploring the sinking of the Endurance, a shipwreck that was just recently found in Antarctica. Before we dive in, we must inform you, the story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the sinking of a vessel and a harrowing tale of survival that may be disturbing to some audiences. Your discretion is advised. Please note before we begin that neither Eleanor nor I are mariners or experts in the field of maritime history, but we have done our research and will present the information as we understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. In today's episode, there are terms in the Norwegian language in which neither of us are fluent, but we'll do our best to give accurate pronunciations. Thank you, Derek. Our story begins in 1912 in Sandefjord, Norway. Polaris, named after the North Star, and which would later be named Endurance, was launched on December 17, 1912. She was originally ordered and built for Adrian de Gerlach and Lars Christensen, built by Framnes Shipyard. Early on into her building, financial problems led Gerlach to pull out of the purchase, leaving Christensen unable to pay for the massive vessel and left the project in danger of being scrapped. Christensen attempted to sell the vessel unsuccessfully for a little over a year due to her unique build as a polar expedition vessel. She was not fast enough and too large to be a pleasure cruising yacht and was deemed not incredibly marketable. That is where our hero of the story, Sir Ernest Shackleton, comes in. Sir Ernest Henry Shackleton of Ireland was an Antarctic explorer who ended up leading three expeditions to the Antarctic, leading what is now known as the Heroic Age of Antarctic Exploration. Shackleton was born on February 15, 1874 in Kilkia, Ireland. Shackleton had a love and interest for the Antarctic from a young age, his first expedition to the frozen continent being as a third officer for Captain Robert Falcon Scott's discovery expedition of 1901 to 1904. Shackleton became ill during this expedition and was consequently sent home early. While home from the expedition, Shackleton got married to his wife Emily Dorman in 1904. During the Nimrod expeditions of 1907 to 1909, Shackleton and three of his comrades established a new record for the farthest south latitude of 88 degrees south. Members of his team also managed to climb Mount Erubus, the most active volcano in the Antarctic region. For these feats, Shackleton was knighted by King Edward VII on his return home in 1909. Wow, sounds like he was quite the adventurer. He definitely was. And this was the man to save the endurance. In January of 1917, he purchased her for roughly 14,000 pounds, which would be roughly 1,757,109 pounds, or $2,294,783 in 2022's currency. She was a gorgeous wooden sailing vessel. Before we continue with the specifications of this ship, we will briefly go over some nautical terminology that some of our listeners may not be familiar with. Take it away, Derek. Thanks, Eleanor. The bow is the very front part of the ship, and the very back end of it is called the stern. The port side is the left, and the starboard side is the right. Propellers are sometimes referred to as screws. The hull is the metal sides of the ship. The keel is the very bottom of it, and the superstructure is the top deck, usually made of wood. Smokestacks, or funnels, are large tunnels on top of the ship used to direct steam and smoke away from the deck. Masts are large wooden poles on the deck of the ship, usually used to hoist sails or hold a crow's nest where crew members can see for miles around the vessel. Beam is a measurement that refers to the width of the ship. Perfect. Now Endurance was a modest sailing vessel for her day, entirely made of wood sheathed in green heart, a wood that is exceptionally sturdy and heavy. Endurance was 144 feet long with a 25 foot beam and weighed in at roughly 350 gross registered tons. As well as three masts including her iconic forward mast which was square rigged, she was also equipped with a 260 kilowatt coal fired steam engine and could reach speeds of up to 10 knots. At her launch, Endurance was the strongest wooden sailing ship ever built and her bow was built tough enough to break through sheets of ice. Her keel was made of four inch thick sheets of oak and Norwegian fir, adding up to a thickness of 85 inches. 
Needless to say, there was a load of attention to detail in her building. The Endurance was also fitted with lovely accommodations for her crew with 10 passenger cabins, a spacious dining saloon and galley, a smoking room, and even a dark room for developing photographs. She was equipped with what we see as necessities now, and luxuries at the time, electric lighting and even one small shared bathroom. For such a moderately sized sailing vessel, she was considered quite bougie. Luxuries? I'm glad we don't live in that time. <laughs> Bathrooms and electricity are definitely a necessity. After the purchase of Polaris in 1914, Shackleton changed her name from Polaris to Endurance after his family motto, translated from Latin into English as, By Endurance We Conquer. Shackleton had the vessel transferred from a yard in Norway to a yard closer to home in London. She arrived at the Millwall Dock in the spring of 1914, and until the end of July that year, she stayed as supplies were gathered for her journey, including equipment, stores, finances, and a crew. The tween, or between, deck was converted to a cargo hold to house supplies for the journey, and the crew instead made their quarters in her forecastle, opting out of the lux accommodations in midships. In the acquisition of new equipment, she also gained three ship boats, two cutters, and a whaling boat meant to be used for off-ship expeditions. She was repainted from white to black and emblazoned with the word endurance in gold lettering on her stern, along with a large gold star. She was a sleek, beautiful-looking vessel hungry for adventure in the South Pole. When seeking sailors for his crew, Shackleton placed the following ad in the Times. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. With a harrowing ad like that, it's difficult to imagine many would have applied. However, he managed to pull together a crew. Despite the warnings, there wasn't actually much worry for a journey to Antarctica. Over the previous 16 years, all voyages to the Antarctic Circle had been successful, except for the loss of the 30-year-old whaling ship Antarctic, which was crushed in the ice. With those odds, the crew of the Endurance felt confident to sail. Are we ever setting sail? Yes, indeed we are. Just not for the South Pole just yet. First, Endurance needed to test herself on the Atlantic. Her maiden voyage was from Plymouth to Buenos Aires, Argentina, and she set sail on August 6, 1914. This voyage was the first before she was go to go to Antarctica, and is referred to as a shakedown voyage. It's basically the equivalent of test driving a car before you purchase it. You wouldn't want to be on the highway and have your brakes go out, and Shackleton wanted to ensure his ship could handle the rough waters of the Atlantic, which at this point had already swallowed many vessels such as SS La Bergeon and the RMS Titanic. On October 26, 1914, Endurance sailed from Buenos Aires to what would be her last port of call, or stop, which was a whaling station at Gritviken on the island of South Georgia, and she safely arrived on November 5, 1914. This stop was important. Here, Shackleton and crew refueled and gathered more needed supplies before they were to head south to Antarctica. Finally, on December 5th, she left for the southern regions of the Weddell Sea. Two days after leaving South Georgia, endurance began to run into hiccups. Before the time of global warming and the melting of the polar ice caps, there was a higher chance of running into thick pack ice, which is ice that isn't attached to a shoreline. Endurance ran into a large bout of this, and it slowed her progress immensely. She was averaging less than 30 miles per day, a staggering loss of progress in comparison to what she was averaging on the more northern parts of the Atlantic. Despite the slow going, the crew remained optimistic, and by January 15th of 1915, they were within 200 miles of their intended destination, Vassal Bay. The crew's celebration didn't last long, however, as conditions worsened. By the following morning, a large gale developed, and heavy pack ice was spotted. In these intense conditions, all the endurance could do was hunker down and wait for weather to improve. Ironically enough, Endurance was actually used using a grounded iceberg for protection from the elements, something the Titanic would never be able to understand. On January 18th, the gale calmed down to a more manageable gust, and Endurance set the top sail with the engine slowed. The pack ice had been blown away by the gale, and the decision was made to press forward with the expedition. 
There was very minimal progress made until Endurance ran into the pack ice. It was thick but soft, and the Endurance was built to press through ice, so they forged ahead. By 5 p.m. that day, Endurance was in the thick of it. This ice was different from what had befallen them before, and soon the ship was beset. She was stranded. The gale picked up and compressed the ice in the Weddell Sea, encompassing Endurance and ice. The endless sea of compacting ice was surrounding the ship as far as the eye could see, and all that could be done was to wait, praying the gale would change direction and decompress the ice. In the wee hours of January 24th, 1915, a wide crack appeared in the ice around 50 yards away from the ship. This gave the men of the Endurance hope that soon the ice would completely break up and the ship would be freed, but unfortunately the break in the ice never reached Endurance. Despite three hours under full sail and full speed on her steam engine, Endurance could not break from the clutches of the brash ice. She was icebound, and her crew's faith was dampened. The temperatures were lower than what was typical of the season, around negative two degrees Fahrenheit, and this only added to the ice's strength. Endurance was going nowhere. On Valentine's Day, a channel of water opened up ahead of the ship, and in the early morning dawn, the crew could see that Endurance was floating in water surrounded by very young ice, only two feet thick, but the pool that Endurance was floating in was surrounded by ice that was roughly 12 to 18 feet thick, far too thick to be broken up by the wooden bow of a sailing vessel, no matter how strong she was. They backed the ship as far as she could move in her small pool and rammed forward into the ice, desperately trying to free the ship, but it was no use. By the end of the day, the ice began to freeze up and harden again, trapping Endurance once more. It was far too risky to continue trying to break up the ice, and the crew called it a day. Endurance's boilers were extinguished to save power, setting the ship adrift until the ice released her naturally. At this point, on February 24th, overnight washers were abolished. The Endurance became a floating version of a shore station buried in ice. Between March and May 2nd of that year, still locked in ice, Endurance drifted with the pack ice around 130 miles west-northwest. The sun disappeared in May, and thus began the Antarctic winter. On July 14th, Endurance was hit by a southwest gale carrying a blizzard, with wind speeds at a staggering 70 miles per hour and temperatures dropping to negative 33 degrees Fahrenheit. The blizzard raged for two days, breaking the pack ice into smaller individual flows. These individual flows began to shift. Now this may seem like good news. Shifting ice means the ship gets freed, right? Wrong. All breaks in the ice were surrounding the ship and never got anywhere near freeing the frozen vessel. During the shifts in flows on August 1st, Endurance was lifted by a pressure wave and tilted her sharply to port before dropping her in the water, and she was afloat for the first time in nearly six months. The breaking in flows tossed the ship around and slammed sheets of ice into her starboard side. Despite this, she remained undamaged. Two more pressure waves struck the ship in late August without consequence. On the evening of August 31st, a slow building pressure gripped the Endurance, causing her hull to creak and shudder, alarming everyone aboard. She hadn't made such sounds before. By September 30th, 1915, hope was once again filled the crew as signs of spring came about the Antarctic Circle. Temperatures began creeping back toward freezing, occasionally breaking freezing, and 10 hours of sunlight per day breaking the long darkness. A large flow was swept up against the Endurance, the ship moaning as her port bow was being continually crushed. A carpenter aboard the ship, Henry McNish, noted that the beams supporting the upper decks of the ship made of solid oak were beginning to bend visibly, looking, as he said, like a piece of cane. The masts were violently whipped back and forth in the gale, warping their stepping points on the keel. Despite this, the ice was still not winning against the Endurance, although she would not be able to continue to withstand the pressure for long. Her decks were buckled permanently after this incident with flows of ice. On October 14th, temperatures of 29 degrees Fahrenheit had been reported, and the ice flows began to separate enough so Endurance to again flow completely surrounded in water and by the 16th, Shackleton ordered steam to be raised so the ship could quickly take advantage of the breaking ice. It took almost four hours for the boilers to be filled with fresh water melted from the surrounding ice, 
and then a leak was discovered that had to be pumped out, repaired, and refilled. The following day, Endurance had her chance in front of her. A flow of open water was spotted. However, only one boiler had been managed to be lit, and there was not sufficient steam to power the engine, so all sails were set in a desperate plea to lunge the ship into the loosening ice. But alas, she wouldn't budge. By October 18th, again, Endurance was packed in ice. By the 24th, following dropping temperatures, the already damaged ship was once again racked by pressure waves, causing a large mass of ice to slam into the stern and completely tear free the stern post away from the whole planking. Around the same time, the bow planking caved in, causing simultaneously flooding in both the fore and aft sections of the ship, flooding the cargo hold and engine room. The crew scrambled, using manual pumps and getting steam to drive the main bilge pumps. The water level continued to rise. The main man-powered deck pumps were useless as their intakes had frozen. By 9 p.m., Shackleton realized he could not save his ship and ordered all supplies, boats, and essential equipment to be taken off the ship and onto the ice. The final order was to abandon ship was given by Shackleton on October 27th, and with a heavy heart, Shackleton had the ship's blue ensign hoisted up her mizzen mast so that she would, in his words, go down with colors flying. They attempted to manually haul the boats and stores over land on sledges. Shackleton realized it would be too intense of a job and that the party would have to camp on ice until it carried them to the north and eventually broke up. Parties were sent back to Endurance to retrieve supplies and to salvage remaining valuables. After two days of abandonment, all but her bow remained above water, with the waves lapping over the forecastle. The crew managed to retrieve nearly 3.5 tons of stores from the sinking vessel. They camped on the ice, exposed to the freezing temperatures and nipping winds, a little under two miles away from the Endurance. She was visible to her crew as the sea slowly overtook her. By November 13th, the deck of the ship was level with the water, and a new pressure wave swept across the pack ice the crew stood on. The masts collapsed inward on themselves as the bow was finally crushed, and Endurance began her final descent. Shortly after this, her mizzen mast was broken and collapsed in on itself. These moments were filmed by expedition photographer Frank Hurley, and this footage remains to this day. Late in the afternoon of November 21st, another pressure wave hit the wreckage and Endurance's stern was lifted high above the ice as flows smashed together. And then as it separated again, the wave swallowed the rest of the Endurance and she disappeared into the ocean. A, a ship built on the motto of By Endurance We Conquer had been conquered by the Earth's one great equalizer, the depths of the ocean. Immediately following the sinking, the ice collapsed in on itself and completely erased any evidence of the ship being there. The position where she sank was fixed at 68 degrees, 38.5 degrees south, 52 degrees, 58 degrees west. But this isn't where the story ends. Endurance may have been gone, but her 28-man crew was still stranded in Antarctica. The crew camped until April 16th of 1916 waiting for the ice flows to carry them north. At this time, Shackleton decided they needed to get out of the Antarctic, and they set sail in the three ship's boats that Endurance had carried with her toward a remote island called Elephant Island, and they eventually made it. By the 24th of April, Shackleton and five others took one of the ship's boats called the James Caird and headed for South Georgia to arrange a rescue for the other 22 men who remained on Elephant Island. Three attempts were made in the three different vessels, and Shackleton found himself unable to successfully traverse the ice in order to rescue his crew. In the fourth attempt, the Yelcho, graciously loaned by the Chilean government, successfully reached Elephant Island and was able to return the crew to the South Georgia. Careful attention was given to keep photographs and all records of the expedition in hopes to ensure Shackleton could collect on his 15,000 pounds insurance policy placed on the Endurance. Miraculously, no men were lost on this expedition. Shackleton later served in the Royal Navy Reserve during World War I from 1917 to 1919 and died on January 5th in 1922 in South Georgia where his journey began. This year, 
In 2022, the Falklands Maritime Heritage Trust's Endurance 22 was successful in its expedition to search for Shackleton's lost endurance. On March 9, 2022, they announced that they'd been successful in finding the wreck in the Weldell Sea at a depth of roughly 9,869 feet, 3.5 nautical miles south of the original estimated marking for the wreckage. In part, the ship's discovery was made possible due to the increasing amount of melting sea ice due to global warming. Due to the extremely cold temperatures in this part of the ocean and the lack of wood-eating bacteria, Endurance remains largely intact. Even the gold lettering remains on her stern. The ship was not salvaged and will remain a protected historical site and monument under the Antarctic Treaty System. You might be asking, what is the legacy Endurance has left behind? Well, thanks to Shackleton's continued research and expeditions to Antarctica, we were able to advance our scientific knowledge of polar ice caps and to unlock some of the mysteries of one of the most dangerous places on Earth. Two Antarctic patrol ships of the UK's Royal Navy have been named Endurance in honor of the ill-fated vessel, and with the expedition to look for the ship, we have seen the damages of the melting polar ice caps. The ice that once held Endurance tightly in its grasp has melted away to the point that it has revealed the ship it swallowed up. Although the finding of endurance is a good thing, you can't argue that it poses alarming signs of global warming's continued negative effects on the planet. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel, Speed Force Media. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or another podcast service, Please subscribe for more content and leave us a five-star review as it does help us reach more listeners like you. Tune in next Sunday for the story of the disappearance and rumored sinking of the SS Neuronic, a white star liner that disappeared and has never been seen again. Have a great week and we will see you next time.